integration provides the opportunity to work in any country in the region through the mutual recognition agreement. Integration enables ASEAN and its members to better shape international arrangements to the collective and individual advantage of all. We can see this in the FTAs of ASEAN forged with major countries, with major economies. They would have taken longer with fewer advantage if each ASEAN nation had to negotiate on its own. In 2007 in Cebu, aside from the declaration on the acceleration of the ASEAN community, we also signed the Cebu Declaration towards a caring and sharing community, the Declaration on the Blueprint of the ASEAN Charter, the Declaration on the Right of Migrant Workers, and the ASEAN Convention to Counter Terrorism. Speaking of counter terrorism brings us to my retrospective on the ASEAN security community. Even before the declaration of the security community in 2003, ASEAN neighbors helped the Philippines deal with a flashpoint of Mindanao. Indonesia played a critical role in the 1996 final peace agreement between our government and the Moro National Liberation Front and continue to support the peace process in my administration by being the head with Malaysia and Brunei as members of the Committee of the Eight of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, which monitored compliance with the MNLF Accord. Indonesia was also the chief supporter of our bid for observer status in the OIC. Malaysia facilitated our negotiations with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which had broken away from the MNLF. After our government and the MILF signed a ceasefire in 2003, Malaysia headed an international monitoring team, including Brunei, to oversee the MILF ceasefire. Our peace process benefited from our ASEAN neighbors and also from interfaith dialogue. Sharing that experience at the 2007 Cebu East Asian Summit, we gave recognition to the importance of interfaith dialogue in enhancing regional peace and security. Also at the Cebu ASEAN Summit, we worked hard to ripen the 2001 Declaration on Counterterrorism into the binding ASEAN Convention on Counterterrorism, not just a declaration, not just an operating agreement of some members, but a formal convention of all the member states. Because it was um, ratified by all the ASEAN nations in the time of Surin, the convention entered into force. And these initiatives, for instance, now underpin the recently started joint air and sea patrols by Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines to stop terrorist infiltration. As for the other ripening from declaration to code, the one about the South China Sea, well, last August here under Duterte's uh, chairmanship, the foreign minister of ASEAN and China adopted the negotiating framework for the code. Now, I have been asked also, what should be the government's approach in dealing with the South China Sea? Well, since ASEAN seems to be making progress on the code of conduct, it would be well to continue its efforts. But learning from my own experience, beyond that, it might not be realistic to expect ASEAN as a group to resolve the issue. In any case, ASEAN and China have gone a long way toward reduced tensions and greater understanding since President Duterte assumed power. So as tensions further diminish, diminish, further opportunities to resolve the differences may emerge. South China Sea in 2007, in the Cebu summit though, was less of a focus than at the time the China-Japan ties that were strained by territorial disputes rival claims to natural resource areas, and other concerns. Most of us recognize 
that the primary reality of our regional and international environment is the role of the US, China, and Japan and the relations among them. The delicate relationship then between China and Japan, the most powerful nations in the region, especially had important implications for regional stability in Asia. Therefore, ASEAN had a stake in ensuring that the China-Japan relationship exerted a beneficial effect on the region's stability. At the sidelines of the Cebu summit, Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe met. They expressed satisfaction that their nation's relations were improving. Abe had visited Beijing the previous October. He said in his opening remarks during their meeting, I hope we can exchange opinions and have fruitful results. Wen Jiabao said, I am happy to see China-Japan relations moving forward. It is in the interest of the people of both sides, Asia, and the world. After the summit, we were happy to read from newspapers in China and elsewhere that one reason for the increasing trust between Prime Minister Abe and Premier Wen was the meeting in Cebu. That added to our pleasure in hosting the plus three of China, Japan, and Korea. At the ASEAN-Korea summit in Cebu, we addressed the concerns about nuclear proliferation in North Korea. The leaders of the ASEAN country stood firm on the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula, calling for concrete and effective steps towards the fulfillment of the 2005 joint statement of the six-party talks, in which North Korea committed to abandon nuclear weapons. The um, foreign ministers of the six-party talks, uh, of, of the six parties, North and South Korea, China, Japan, Russia, and the U.S., later found themselves together at the ASEAN, at the ASEAN Regional Forum ministerial meeting in August 2007 in Manila, still under our chairmanship. With our ASEAN neighbors, we attach great value to the ARF, which had been formed in 1994 as the security forum in the Asia-Pacific region where ASEAN could engage regional and global players on political and security issues. ARF is a confidence-building body. It has no pretensions to be a legally-oriented organization. Now to the social cultural community. Months before the Bali Summit of 2003, which declared the ASEAN social cultural community, the global scare of SARS offered a focus for ASEAN health cooperation. In April that year, ASEAN held an emergency summit to combat the epidemic. Singapore and Malaysia placed Filipino workers, health workers, in the front lines in the battle against SARS in their countries. That highlighted the value of our Filipino workers in ASEAN. Having been the proponent of the social cultural community in 2003, it was but natural for the Philippine chairmanship in 2007 to follow through on our initiative by pushing for the declaration towards one caring and sharing community, which we made our theme. Also, the declaration on the migrant workers plus floating the idea of debt-to-equity swaps for the UN Millennium Development Goals. Our most contentious chairman's initiative for social cultural community building was the Declaration on Migrant Workers. The declaration committed to promote decent, humane, productive, dignified, and remunerative employment for migrant workers. The issue was complicated because ASEAN had both labor exporting and labor and labor receiving countries with deep differences of opinion. But we availed of our chairmanship to push that initiative on account of the so many Filipino workers overseas. Among the commitments of the declaration was to develop an, an ASEAN instrument 
on the protection and promotion of migrant workers' rights. In 2009, the ASEAN Summit under the chair of uh, Prime Minister Abbasid came out with the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint. And we have much to learn from him about it today, especially since he wrote a most substantive essay for the fifth anniversary of ASEAN on the ASCC. On this 50th year of ASEAN, guided by President Duterte's chairmanship team, partnering for change, engaging the world, I'm gratified that the President has identified the core priorities as building a people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN, maintaining a peaceful and stable region, promoting ASEAN's resiliency, advancing inclusive and innovative growth, cooperating in maritime security, and promoting, promoting ASEAN as a model for regionalism and as a global player. These are appropriate core properties for ASEAN as it celebrates 50 years. For half a century, ASEAN has kept the peace, expanded our economies, and drawn closer through trade, diplomacy, and cultural exchange. We're a diverse, multi-ethnic, multi-religious region at different levels of social and economic development. It's remarkable that ASEAN has resisted the temptation to drift apart. Instead, we are on a steady arc of comity, cooperation, and community. I view as the most pressing challenge for ASEAN how to advance the sense of community and our shared interests and look after each other in terms of social justice, economic development, and common security. As an economic community, the challenge is to look after each other in terms of economic development. As a security community, the challenge is to look after each other in terms of common security by cooperating to counter, prevent, and suppress terrorism. That's why I pushed so hard during my chairmanship to sign the ASEAN Convention on Terrorism. As a social cultural community, the challenge is to look after each other in terms of social justice and compassion. That's why I pushed hard during my chairmanship for the Declaration on Migrant Workers. And now, the continuing challenge is to sign the ASEAN instrument on the protection and promotion of the rights of migrant workers. I am gratified that last September, the ministers of the ASCC endorsed the ASEAN consensus on the protection and promotion of the rights of migrant workers for signing this November. Yet, for all that ASEAN has accomplished, the bold step of establishing, of establishing the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015 doesn't mean we have won the race. We are in a marathon, not a sprint. Our eye is not just on ASEAN at age 50. It is also on ASEAN at age 100. We must ask, what will ASEAN look like 50 years from today? If we had a market of 650 million today, we will be over a billion people in 50 years. If we are the fastest growing region today, we will likely be a more mature, modest growth region in 50 years. And if we are unsure of global security and the threat of upstart nations getting nuclear weapons today, what will we face in 50 years? Each question begs an answer. We need to make sure our answer is consistent with our social needs, embraces a sustainable economic model, and ensures regional and global peace. When we think ahead and ponder the next 50 years, we see increasing prosperity and the possibility of greater income disparity. We see a more peaceful world and more nations with nuclear capability. We see a cleaner environment and the challenge of global, global warming, affecting government policies and our economic model and having a decisive impact on our lives. The future will belong to those nations who seek common ground to resolve common problems. This is true in every aspect of our lives, economy, social justice, and security. All the hope and anxiety about the future leads us to one conclusion. 
we must all press for ever closer cooperation in ASEAN if we are to collectively benefit from the good and collectively tackle the challenges to get together. The number of globe-sized issues we will face in the 21st century requires global-sized cooperation. The place to start is building stronger regional entities like ASEAN and expanding their political, economic, and security influence to other partners around the world in the next 50 years. Thank you.